see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with uh, Jason Marsh. Thank you for joining me, Jason. Sure. Thanks for having me, Edwin. And uh, Jason, you're the uh, editor-in-chief over to Greater Good at UC Berkeley. Right. And uh, I see it's now a Greater Good, not Greater Good Science Center. Did you drop that science? No, part? no, it's still the Greater Good Science Center. Okay. Our, um, from the time we, we launched uh, our magazine, Greater Good, it was Greater Good magazine published by the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Uh, we now shifted the magazine to be entirely online. So Greater Good is now this online magazine, this multimedia platform on which we report on the science of compassion and empathy and altruism. Uh, the greater the greater good science center is the umbrella organization okay and and as an editor there i've seen you've done uh, a lot of interviews about empathy and you've written a lot about it so this is uh seems to be a real uh, topic of interest for you uh yeah definitely um yeah, it's of interest to myself and definitely you know one of as we kind of chart the the science of of a meaningful life as we call it you know empathy is definitely one of those foundations of a meaningful life individually and of the greater good more broadly. Yeah. Well, what we wanted to explore kind of in, in this uh, discussion is like, how can we go about building a culture of empathy? And so what I thought sure. is maybe we would kind of do it in three parts. You know, the first part, just kind of get to know you a little bit more and kind of your thoughts about empathy and then go into uh, the greater good into kind of an overview of what the greater good uh, science center's work is on empathy. And then the third part, which maybe I would put into a separate video clip, is to talk about your article about the David Brooks uh, Limits of Empathy article. I thought that sure. was a real important kind of a, kind of a topic there. So uh, to start with, um, you know, I've been asking people about what their most important value in life is. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's kind of the most important value for you personally? Uh... Wow. Well, I would say, um, yeah, I've been thinking about this because I uh, mentioned it. I'm, you know, in, in some ways, um, uh, compassion might, I'm, you know, I might say compassion is, is my um, most important value, um, partly because it's in some ways very broad. I think it encompasses um not only you know just a, a feeling of connection you know and suffering with someone else but also um along with that you know a, an ability to um accept people and, and meet them where they are without without judgment i think it's it's hard to hold um compassion for someone while also um judging them you know and, and uh feeling like you're somehow superior to them in a lot of ways you know, when you allow yourself to experience compassion, a lot of those feelings that can get in the way of those kinds of, you know, connections between people really kind of fall away. Yeah. Well, what I've been interested in is like people's values, like what's their most important value? And, you know, mine is empathy. So mm -hmm. then I'm going to try to make the connection between that value and empathy. You know, how, how, do, yeah. those, how do those people's values relate? You know, some people say, well, you know, peace is most important. Justice is most important. So I think the relationship between values is, is uh, and all those variety of values that people have and how they relate to empathy is something I'm really wanting to explore. Yeah, so, that's so, a, so that's why I'm kind of asking about it. And what yeah, I find is really like, uh, you and I might be too like minded. My my value is, is too close to that. Making the jump from empathy to compassion is not enough of a jump at all. I could say something that could be a little bit further afield. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great one, though, because there is a lot of confusion between empathy and compassion. You know, a lot of people use them interchangeably, and they are, people are always ask me, hey, what's the difference? And, you know, I've got my definitions, and you know, everybody else seems to have theirs yeah. as yeah. well, you know. But, well, yeah, I'm curious. I mean, what do you say when, when people ask you that? Well, you know, it, it kind of comes down to, which was going to be my next area, is like, well, how are we defining uh, empathy uh -huh. And for me, I see empathy as four parts, a kind of a self-empathy, you know, sensory awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves, yeah. a mirrored empathy, kind of through mirror neurons reflecting uh, what's going on, uh, you know, 
uh, emotionally and physically, you know, mirroring that happens. Mm -hmm. A uh, imaginative empathy, which is sometimes called cognitive empathy or perspective taking, which is kind of connecting the mirrored part with more of a being able to take somebody else's position, see the world kind of from their point of view, which mm -hmm. comes seeing yourself as a separate being. And then the fourth part is empathic action, which is that as we see our common humanity, we take the kind of, we're just wired to, to want to for the, see the well-being of others and kind of act for that well-being. And for me, the compassion part is, is the slice of empathy applied to uh, suffering of someone else, that we have empathy for the full spectrum of experiences. And then what do we do when we have, we empathize with someone suffering? And that's for me what I call um, uh, uh, compassion. So mm -hmm. just wondering how that kind of resonates with your understanding and definitions. Uh, yeah, no. It uh, resonates pretty pretty strongly. I mean, yeah, empathy can refer to, um, you know, one can feel empathy in response to a pretty wide range of um, emotions. You know, I mean, it's just that that very basic, you know, the kernel of the um, emotional response or even you know, the cognitive response, as you were saying. Um, but it could be in response to anger or happiness, you know, or fear. Um, Whereas, yeah, compassion is, in some ways, requires then it's it's an additional step. I mean, one can look at empathy as just being a very basic kind of you know elementary response, and then compassion is both um, you know the attunement to one's suffering, like that particular slice of um, emotion or experience that you might be observing in someone else. Um, but then also, you know, it goes beyond just that basic empathic response, which is really just this, you know, at a very basic kind of, you know, emotional or physiological level, um, sensing that other person's um, uh, distress or fear or whatever their emotion may be. Um, and then compassion is in some ways requires a little bit of, I wouldn't say um, interpretation, but is in some ways just the next step of then actually um, not just feeling or having some sense of that emotion, but then um, emoting suffering with that person and having some desire to help or alleviate that suffering um, doesn't necessarily always lead to, sometimes it can or won't necessarily lead to some kind of action, you know, which could then fall more into the territory of altruism, um, but could at least, you know, at least begins to create those stirrings of one's sense of the suffering, uh, feeling that suffering and a desire to alleviate that suffering. Yeah, so <clears throat> you're saying, if I'm understanding it, that the empathy can be applied to kind of all different feelings. You're like, mm -hmm. as you're kind of putting your hand down here or shaking your head, my mirror neurons are reflecting what it is that you're doing. You're you're moving your head to the side. So I kind of have this, oh, he's being very thoughtful <laughs> or something like that, kind of feeling yeah. or smiling and that humor. So I'm picking up the motor experiences of what you're doing as well as the, the emotions kind of attached to that mm -hmm. and that that would be kind of the empathic uh would be my sensing that in you through uh you know mirror neurons would be kind of a part of empathy right uh -huh. yeah although i would well yes uh you know that that sensing either um as you're saying sort of what can be called cognitive empathy just the basic understanding um of you know that someone else is thinking or feeling something and then having some basic sense of, of what that might be being able to say to sort of you know, take their perspective um but you know that's yeah to a pretty broad range of emotions and doesn't necessarily suggest that um you're going to be in any way motivated to actually you know not only to actually take action um in response to whatever it is you sense you 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 observe that they are thinking or feeling um and right, so it could be on a cognitive level or on the affective or emotional level where you could be sensing their emotions as well, again, without even necessarily suggesting you would want to, you'd be motivated to take any steps to, you know, improve their, their emotional condition. Um, the other thing as well, I mean, I'm curious, in, in, when you're doing these interviews, what, um, in talking to some of the scientists as well, um, how people react to 
uh, the whole notion of, of mirror neurons, because, you know, it's a not uncontroversial topic within the scientific literature. I mean, I think there's um, pretty wide agreement that there is some, you know, biological, neurobiological, even genetic basis, evolutionary basis to empathy. Uh, the extent to which mirror neurons themselves are responsible for that, um, you know, for that, that, uh, trait, you know, is, is uh, I think, still a matter of, of great debate and uncertainty. Yeah, well, I asked that very question to uh, inter in an interview I just did a, a week or two ago with uh, Christian uh, Kiesers, who had, uh, I don't know if you know him, but he wrote the book, The Empathic Brain, and he had uh, a neuroscience lab uh, in, in uh, Amsterdam at the uh -huh. university there. And he also worked in Parma, Italy, uh, yeah. And he was, he kind of came up with the uh, connection. They had come up with the connection of motor motions being right. mirrored. And then he took it, did some tests, uh, research on using disgust to show how disgust was actually, people were feeling other people's disgust. So he made the connection between the motor actions mm -hmm. and the emotions that were kind of behind yeah. it. And I asked him that very question. I said, you know, people are saying that this is kind of a questionable uh, area and he says well they just haven't read the literature mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was his take on it so you know you get a, a room full of scientists together and you know what do you have <laughs> yeah it's, no, I, really I, 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 yeah and no, I had a similar conversation um, we had with V.S. Ramachandran who's a you know, neuroscientist at um, UC San Diego and he also is a real champion of, of mirror neurons although is you know still um, somewhat cautious feels like the literature is still evolving uh, but he really feels like you know they are a vital you know groundbreaking discovery and that you know will be found to be you know significantly linked to not just um, mirroring of, of motor actions but also of emotional experiences um, which is where you know the a lot of the debate and controversy comes in especially is that even even within um, the, in the motor field you know the mirror neurons have been it's estimated that they're, I believe, 15 to 20 percent, account for 15 to 20 percent neurons, and then um, perhaps less so in terms of um, um, you know, neurons implicated in, in emotional or affective experience. And I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's still evolving. There's still different debates. There's still clearly, like, the discovery itself is a fascinating one, although I think, you know, it's, it's worth saying that, um, and I'm not a neuroscientist, anywhere near a neuroscientist, just to, you know, occasionally have the ability to talk with or interview neuroscientists. Um, but even beyond mirror neurons, regardless of what, what the research actually suggests about, um, about uh, the prevalence or you know, functionality of mirror neurons, there's other, other literature on other uh, you know, biological mechanisms that are, are implicated in empathy, suggesting that there is some kind of biological basis, regardless of whether we talk about empathy on a biological level, be mirror neurons firing or activity in certain regions of the brain, um, or you know, even uh, the existence of, of certain uh, genes, there does clearly seem to be some biological basis to it. Yeah, the uh, relationship of oxytocin, for example, at the chemical level. So there's all these different levels that this uh, operates at. But if we're talking about, uh, you know, the science of it, there's also still debate about global warming, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at what point, you know, is the threshold where it kind of becomes accepted and, and so forth, you know. Yeah. Although I would say the debate on, on empathy, mere neurons is uh, far more nascent and... Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's nowhere near, I think, as far along as the debate on, on global warming. I think, uh, you know, there are most, almost all, all scientists at this point will not say there's really any active debate on global warming, whereas I think even the neuroscientists who, I mean, even Ramachandran, who I spoke with, who's an active champion of, of uh, uh, mirror neurons and their importance, feels like, you know, there's still this debate that will need to happen, and there's still a lot more science that needs to happen, but he feels like, based on what he knows so far, uh, that science will point in a certain direction. Yeah, and it's still fairly new. It looked within the last fifteen years, I think. Is so it's yeah. still kind of a new area, and and there seems to be so many labs out there studying it now around the country, yeah. in the world. It's amazing.
So then the other part with the with the uh, compassion was is that there seems to be this notion of going from empathy of where we're empathizing with someone going to action uh, right. uh, component. And within, uh, you know, sometimes I'm hearing people say within the compassion community, well, it's like the compassion is where the action kind of comes in because you're wanting to alleviate suffering. Uh -huh. um, so there's another part to that, though, for me is I've done like, uh, uh, res you know, um, mediation type processes yeah. where people are in conflict and they're, they're pissed off. They're judging each other. You know, they're kind of going at each other. And a core part of restorative uh, processes is that the mediators uh, do like em empathy for the, the participants. They kind of start right. the process with empathy. And the whole process gets people to start seeing and hearing each other. And at some point in the process, I see people actually get, you know, they really start seeing what the humanity of the other person is, is what's important to them. And then at the last part of all these different processes is how do we work together now? Mm -hmm. And then there's like an action component that happens and it doesn't seem to come out of, it doesn't seem to come out of, uh, you know, oh, you're suffering. I want to alleviate your suffering. It comes out of, it, it comes out of, hey, you're, I see your humanity and you're part of me and right. I want your well-being. Uh -huh. And you want my well-being, and we kind of negotiate, like um, we negotiate, uh, like what our next steps are. Like we're going to meet, you know, for coffee every day, or if there's a problem, how we're going to solve the problem. And I've heard uh, one definition of empathy being empathy is one of the blocks to action uh, that don't exclude are removed. So you you know it from working, I'm sure, and you're mm -hmm. you know with other people when you're working with people and somebody doesn't feel heard is they kind of block the action to how you're moving forward, you know, be right. cynicism. Mm -hmm. And then when you're really working in harmony with someone where you really kind of are connecting deeply, you work together in kind of a very smooth, uh, shared kind of uh, integrative way. So that's kind of where I'm seeing the empathic action. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how that, you know, how that kind of fits with your understandings of yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's fair. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it's difficult as I think, you know, at first, you know, experiencing empathy, I think, can pave the way um, to other actions, you know, whether it's forgiveness, you know, or other, other mechanisms involved in, in conflict resolution. Um, you know, empathy, one can experience empathy without necessarily getting to those places without taking those particular actions mm -hmm. um, but it's in some ways you know the building block um, or a vital first step toward those other actions um, you know sort of a compassionate action could be one among many types of actions that could be spurred by empathy um, so I think that's fair it isn't necessarily that empathy then leads to compassion which leads to altruism um, I think you know empathy can lead in many different directions compassion could be one of them um, and from compassion you know once you feel compassion, um, some type of altruistic action could be one outcome as well, but isn't necessarily always going to be. And one can even get to some of those places um, without feeling empathy or altruism. I think it's important to say as well. I mean, for certain people, um, you know, they may, I mean, for instance, uh, um, you know, people, there was recently a study here at, at Berkeley that looked at um, religious and non-religious people. This is hopefully not getting too far off the field, although it's sort of an interesting tangent, I guess. Uh, and found that when you induced compassion in, in more secular and more religious people, the more secular people um, were then more likely to perform an altruistic action. The religious people were no more likely to perform an altruistic action. Compassion didn't seem to foster or promote any greater sense of altruism, but that didn't mean that the religious people were less altruistic than the, than the other people. They were, they were no less altruistic. They just had different motivations. You know, in those cases, um, it could very easily be because they are adhering to a particular, um, uh, particular code, particular religious code that sort of dictated a certain type of altruistic behavior. Um, so, you know, so it was not in any way, I think, a clear line or path from any one of these experiences or emotions to a particular kind of action, um, but often you know they're 
vital building blocks for any type of kind of positive or pro-social action we want to take, whether it's conflict resolution or just a feeling of compassion or, or compassionate al uh, or altruistic action. Yeah, so it's hard to tease out all these different relationships and kind of have a kind of get a sense of the, the relationship of, of all these different values to each other and all these different processes. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know it's not to say that any of them are any more or less important than the others. It's just to say that um, you know it's it's not to, it's just to conflate as what often happens is to conflate empathy and compassion and altruism is you know what often happens, but really you know they're they're different experiences different processes that can lead in very different directions. Yeah. Well, what are the directions you're seeing then for empathy? You're saying, well, empathy won't necessarily lead to action. What um, are you seeing as kind of the, the, what, where will empathy lead to? Um, possibly? Well, in general, I'm saying it won't necessarily lead to compassion just for the reasons you're identifying and that, you know, there are certain types of, of, of emotions or states that you might empathize with that don't really call for a compassionate response only involve suffering necessarily. Um, but they could induce another type of experience, you know, um, that could lead to another another kind of outcome, um, you know, be it sadness or anger or, you know, or whatever it may be. Um, and, yeah, and then there are times when, it, you know, it may not lead to inaction at all. And I think it's, um, you know, some would argue that um, effective empathy, you know, being able to experience someone else's emotions, um, could actually lead one to, if you really empathize with someone else, you could want to avoid their emotions and their experience um, because, you know, you're just so overwhelmed by the feeling that's contagious from that you've sort of, that you've sort of uh, caught from them. Um, you don't necessarily know what to do with it or have any kind of constructive way to respond to it and you may want to distance yourself from it or avoid that person. Um, because you don't know how to respond, you don't really like the feeling necessarily, or you're even concerned that you know you won't be able to, you'll you'll burn out potentially um, if you continue to expose yourself to that person and and sense what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So it's like if there's someone maybe in distress and there's a lot of distress around, and and you're there empathizing with all this distress, that you just it's like you just kind of become overwhelmed through that em empathy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and then there, there at that point, it seems there's also the quality, the, the sense of sympathy too. I mean, there's all these this whole uh, constellation of of words in you know like empathy and compassion and sympathy, right. and within right. a lot of communities, the sympathy is actually seen as a block to empathy, mm -hmm. in the sense that oh, you're in distress, oh, and I feel you know I have a sense of distress now too because you're in distress, right, and it actually blocks the reflection of the other person's space and mm -hmm. uh, a feeling because you've kind of taken it on. It's kind of like instead of, uh, you know, standing in your shoes, I'm kind of like stealing your shoes, right? It's like I'm taking yeah. and they're my shoes now. <laughs> and and uh, so it's and then there's all these different processes which are, you know, teach you how to uh, do kind of empathic listening where you are kind of reflecting back what you're hearing right. the person so you're kind of like mirroring but you're still keeping your consciousness kind of open uh to empathize with your own feelings empathize uh, you know feel uh other people's as well so you don't kind of become overwhelmed so kind of that whole direction is kind of like a whole question you know of really to explore too yeah um yeah definitely i mean uh, you know, the sympathy, empathy, connection or distinction is, you know, often fundamental to any of these conversations. I mean, often, you know, one sees sympathy as, um, um, often, you know, they're, they're, one, is, one is sort of feeling for someone else without necessarily feeling what they are feeling. And often it could suggest even a slight power imbalance that there's sometimes implied a certain degree of, of pity that one may take or feel towards, towards someone else. Um, and so it's often, I think, there are these implications of, you know, condescension or something that, um, you know, sometimes could be not, maybe not to the degree of condescension, but appropriate where one is, one feels, you know, sympathy for someone who has, has lost a loved one. Um, you know, they could feel a certain degree of, of empathy as well, but it's often, you know, you are 
feeling for that person, they've experienced something that, that you have not experienced and it's really hard to really say with, with any real honesty that you put yourself in their shoes and are really feeling what they're feeling because you know, the depth of their grief could be so much deeper than anything that you really can uh, experience in that moment. Um, so, you know, sympathy could be just the most emotionally realistic or appropriate response. Yeah, so not only do you have the individual feeling of empathy, sympathy, compassion, but they can all be mixed in together at the varying degrees kind of right. within us. And yeah, how, how do we, it's hard, you know, I, I, it's, uh, I wouldn't say that there's any hierarchy between them. Any one is, is better than the other. Really, it's just a matter. It's so, it's so context specific. Well, you know, we're kind of going on about these definitions, but I think it's uh, really important because, for example, in the Supreme Court uh, hearings around, uh, you know, when Obama said he was going to choose a Supreme Court justice that, Right. Um, had empathy and like all hell blo broke loose and Fox <laughs> News for almost two weeks. I don't know if you watch Fox, but it's like yeah, almost oh, no. every program yeah. was like, oh, how horrible this empathy is. And it was like on and on and on. Right. And uh, Jeff Sessions was talking about it on this in the Senate floor. He yeah. says, what is empathy? You know, <laughs> and yeah. and because the, the lack of clarity around the definitions and how people are using this, I think, leads to a lot of uh, confusion. And, and some people people have these different definitions and uh, and, you know, the, the, and they actually use the words interchangeably. So Jeff Sessions was using empathy saying this is empathy, and then he would use sympathy interchangeably. Uh -huh. And so it's just like really mud muddying the water. And I think right. he has legitimate, he has legitimate, um, you know, points there that, well, what is the empathy? What does it mean? Yeah. And uh, Phyllis Schlafly, uh, who's, you know, well known in conservative circles, for example, she, you know, was a spokesperson against the ER, mm -hmm. ER women, yeah. ERA, ERA, yeah. ERA, yeah. And she's kind of did like some, you know, talks on uh, we shouldn't have empathy in the schools. And one reason she was giving is, is there's not a, a clear definition for it, a scientific definition. So I think these uh -huh. definitions do, you know, are, are important and to, you know, really dig into it, I think is, you know, really needs to be done and yeah. get some clarity. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, another way of approaching this is... Um, uh, like metaphors, like, uh, you know, empathy is often seen as standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. Right. And uh, for me, empathy is like a cornucopia, you know, it's this kind of this richness of opening a door to experience. I was wondering if you have a, a metaphor of what empathy is like for you. Um, well, I mean, I guess I often do fall back on... Um, the putting oneself in 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 someone else's shoes um partly because i think when you know i first started writing about empathy and you know developing articles about it for greater good and editing articles you know initially we were kind of making the distinction between empathy and sympathy um and it was clear that you know sympathy you know one is more um giving oneself more to remove and feeling um, you know, directing their feelings toward someone else, but not necessarily um, feeling with them. You know, not as you said, you're you're not really in their shoes. You're you know perhaps looking at their shoes uh, and and uh, or looking down at their shoes conceivably. Um, so you know there is that kind of bleeding of self and other that I think um, the whole metaphor of you know putting yourself in someone else's shoes kind of nicely captures. Um, and it also, to me, you know, harkens back one of the, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in, in your conversations about empathy probably harken back to this as well. But for me, um, just growing up, one of the best lessons in empathy was from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And that, um, I believe it was putting yourself in someone else's shoes and walking around, um, is one of the lessons that, that Atticus Finch, you know, uh, tries to teach his daughter. Um, and so, you know, that image and, and that illusion, um, allusion to empathy really stuck with me and, you know, that I kind of read about and internalized and kind of a formative period in my own development. And I, and I feel like that has always really stuck with me as being, you know, in the case of, of that book, really um, essential to one's own 
moral growth as a as a person and you know teaches certain moral lessons that I think certainly in the case of that book seem to cut across you know um, race or age or you know geography um, and that it's you know just when you're when you engage in that basic process you know then you have to be open to what kinds of lessons what kinds of like moral implications um, arise from 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 doing that so you you still remember uh, seeing the movie or reading the book and learning those lessons yeah reading the book uh, I think we did see the movie and I've seen the movie here and there like over the years I think we did eventually watch it maybe in English class or something but but yeah the book um, was uh, I mean like for a lot of people you know had a huge impact on it yeah it seems to be you know there's so few movies about uh, empathy most of the movies are about you know conflict and dominating and fighting and judgment yeah. and all that that's like one of the few you know out there that really kind of model empathy so yeah yeah well i like to find people's metaphors where they kind of come up with their own creative ones <laughs> you're, yeah. you're kind of cheating <laughs> use yeah, it when no, it's no, already no. there I, it, I, but, but truthfully you know i it's funny cause i uh yeah i mean that i'm i'm just you know borrowing that that uh metaphor entirely from harper lee just because it's it's you know what has stuck with me, and in some ways, it's like that whole metaphor, that whole line of thinking has kind of framed my own uh, thinking, and you know, was my doorway, you know, into a lot of these issues in the first place. So, um, yeah, I can, can blame her. Uh, do you know? Uh, do you have a metaphor for uh, compassion? Then, how would uh, that? What would that be like? And um, hmm. um. Yeah, I mean the, the the metaphor that's kind of comes up that's also sort of shaped by uh, some of the work we did in our compassion issue, you know, eight years ago, um, is a sort of maybe grotesque and 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 uh, I think you know sort of psychologically inaccurate metaphor, which is just you know one's one's hearts uh, sort of you know almost bleeding or blurring together, um, and you know like the if you locate one's own uh, feelings of compassion, emotional experience, you know, in, in the chest, you know, uh, sort of extending out from your chest and, and being able to connect whatever that feeling is going on inside yourself with, um, you know, the same type of or similar type of emotional experience or experience of, of uh, suffering that, that one might be experiencing, someone, someone you're observing is experiencing. Um, which I know like, a lot of psychologists would, would uh, take issue with that metaphor because, you know, they would argue that, um, and certainly Dacher Keltner, who's our, um, our faculty director here at the center, has tried to make the case that, um, you know, there's, there's a, one has really great incentives to be, there are good rational reasons to, to be compassionate. That's not simply just being a, a bleeding heart, you know, and following your heart, but there's actually, you know, your brain, there's uh, not only is there, are there are certain, regions of the brain or certain brain activity that's associated with um, feelings of compassion or, or compassionate action, um, but that, um, you know, there's, uh, there are like evolutionary reasons why one would be compassionate as well. So you're not just following your heart to the exclusion of, you know, your rational self-interest, the two actually, um, you know, can, can work in, in harmony. Um, that said, you know, Dacher still has done, done work, um, on sort of the biology of compassion and, and identifying, um, one's vagal tone, the activity of, of the vagus nerve, which sort of, um, uh, extends into the brain and goes down, um, you know, through the chest, um, and down even, even lower. Um, but that, um, his research finds that, you know, people's experiences of compassion when they're confronted with images of suffering um, actually translates, you know, is, is correlates with um, one's, the activity of one's vagal nerve, and which, which actually, um, you know, manifests in their breathing patterns and regulates their breathing. Um, so that, 
you know, when people feel compassion, but actually their breathing slows down. We often think of, you know, people getting kind of worked up and seeing how someone else is suffering, but instead what happens is that um, uh, people's heart rate actually slows. Um, perhaps the evolutionary argument goes perhaps uh, preparing yourself to comfort someone else uh, who's suffering rather than, you know, being kind of agitated and, and you know, wanting to flee or harm that person. Yeah, well, every metaphor is very personal. Like I've asked people about metaphors for empathy and like, it's amazing. Almost everyone has a different metaphor that they come up with. So if, if yours is, you know, two hearts bleeding into each other, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, I think as valid as any other one. It's just, it's kind of like yeah. what, whatever comes to mind is kind of what right. I'm kind of exploring. Yeah. It's, it's a bit right. like the Rorschach, those Rorschach tests, you know? some some hesitation or qualifications because I feel like you know uh, not only yeah because I think psychologically uh, it's it's even more than that but but that is I think for me going back you know years and years um, still the image that that comes to mind yeah I was just I mean I just thought of, and I, one just came to me too maybe I can share that too is that it's like putting on you know standing in someone in each other's shoes and and sitting in a hot tub together <laughs> <laughs> Because it's that warmth, you know, it's that right. quality. For me, the, the compassion is like, a, it has an extra dose of oxytocin or something. And, you know, we're just kind of bathed in that warmth. And, you know, I've done, uh, you know, Google image searches on uh, images about compassion. And the majority of them are about, uh, are about um, consoling someone, you know, right. it's a, soldiers consoling each other you know mother consoling a child a friend consoling so uh that whole quality of that warmth that comes through and which seems to be that's kind of like the heart you know kind of has maybe that quality yeah so well um then i guess we can move on to uh we could go i think we could probably spend hours on just definitions here to work this through and right. i think it actually needs to be done um I talked to uh, Marco Iacoboni about it. He said there's really a need for some, you know, scholar to really tie all this together for kind of more clarity. So, um, but maybe we can just kind of move on to how do we go about building a culture that's a uh, culture of empathy? How do we kind of foster uh, that uh, quality within society? And I know you, you had a couple ideas about that. I'm sorry. I was hopefully going to. I'm saying, I mean, you mean to turn this off or just let it go? Oh, just let it go. It's fine. I, it happens to me all the time, too. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, one more. So, yeah. So, it's a great question. You know, a uh, big, huge question that I don't pretend to have any uh, definitive answers to. But, um, you know, from, from my own reading and the research that we cover here at Greater Good and, you know, um, Articles that I've assigned, developed, edited, and 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 written. I think um, there are a few lessons that stand out. Um, I think one, um, perhaps obviously, is to um, encourage contact between people. I mean, I think a lot of research looking at divisions. You know, I think in some ways you could look at an inability to feel empathy with someone else. If empathy is in some ways. Um, um, feeling, you know, or sensing one's own emotions or thoughts, you know, uh, within yourself, um, there is this, you know, even though you're remaining as, you know, your own, you're retaining your own subjectivity and, and your own identity, um, there's starting to be this bleeding of the self and the other. And um, what a lot of research suggests is that, you know, when we are unable to kind of bridge those divides between people, you know, we're more likely to see people just as the other, someone who's in an out-group as opposed to our own in-group. Um, and in those cases, we're much less likely not just to feel for them or feel with them, but also to want to help them or care very much about their lot in life. And um, however, you know, there's a lot of research suggesting that it's possible to overcome those kinds of differences, whether they be along racial or ethnic or um, you know, national, national lines. Um, and, you know, one of the main ways to do that is uh, by promoting contact between groups, between people who could fall into different groups um, and particular kinds of contact. Like often just the contact itself isn't necessarily 
going to save the day. Um, so there are certain principles that go along with it. We don't need to necessarily get into all of them. Um, but, um, you know, providing, promoting contact between groups so they have a chance to get to know one another as humans, as individuals, rather than just seeing them as part of this other social group is really key. Um, and then, you know, opens the door to, I think, um, being able to more deeply empathize with them because you are starting to sense that they are, you know, uh, a human being just like you are rather than, you know, some, you know, non-human or dehumanized other uh, who you have no real emotional stake in at all. Um, so, you know, that has implications for, um, for a lot, for, you know, everything from conceivably, um, you know, education um, in trying to make our schools less segregated, um, even potentially um, targeting for the importance of affirmative action and giving people more opportunity to um, get to know one another, socialize with people who could otherwise be dismissed as different from them, um, you know, in, in the context of um, an educational institution where they're sort of, where that type of contact seems to have the sanction or approval of authorities, you know, people who are sort of in charge of making big decisions about what kind of community they're creating within the school, um, to workplaces, you know, where, where um, people often create a deeper sense of allegiance or, you know, camaraderie with people who they're working with, especially when they have some kind of shared stake um, in the outcome of their work and their fates are sort of tied to the success of their work. So I think, you know, in that process of connecting with other people or of, um, of having con just basic contact with them and working together, um, you you open the door to, um, or you sort of, you know, not to mix too many metaphors here, but you um, pave the way for them to um, connect on a deeper level and start to empathize with people who could be dismissed as the other. I love mixed metaphors, but I think mixing metaphors is where creativity happens. It's like when you get two metaphors that come together and kind of melding them together is, is uh, like, I think it was... Uh, Christian Kiesers, he he talked about the uh, the the banana with a, a thousand legs. You know, so, so yeah, let's mix those metaphors. <laughs> the door and paving the way. You're not just you're in the house, you open the door, then you've also paved the way that goes to somebody else's house, and then you open their door, you open their window, whatever it may be. Uh, but yeah, you can use all kinds of metaphors there to suggest you know that type of of connection where you're bridging bridging divides that could be hard to bridge sometimes. Yeah, and, and well, what I would look at is, I would like to see the government like consciously say we need a culture of empathy and compassion. You know, there becomes a cultural value, and then because you kind of need that background that uh, to implement, you know, policy. So instead of education being about oh, we need kind of uh, you know, like you're saying, like uh, um, bringing different groups together. You know, they had busing and all that. It wasn't grounded. It was kind of grounded on more like maybe on equality or equal opportunity mm -hmm. versus we need to come together for empathic, you know, to deepen the empathy of society. Right. So um, it's like, what do you think about that? Having the government actually take that on as a cultural value and then yeah, start I mean, I think for a lot of things, you know, they're very hard uh, to implement, you know, uh, on an individual or you know person by person basis, it really does require um, for it to be done on a big enough scale and be done effectively. Um, you know, a certain degree of, of approval and engineering, even by some bigger entity, whether you know it, on the biggest scale, obviously uh, the government or the federal government. Um, you know, on a smaller scale, it could be um, a university admissions board, you know, or the administration, or you know, a school board, or um, you know, the CEO of a, of a company. Um, but, but obviously, yeah, on a, on a bigger scale, uh, partly because, you know, in the cases of, say, the school districts in Louisville and Seattle that did try, that, you know, did try to integrate schools or, or work against the increasing de facto segregation of their schools, the Supreme Court in that case, you know, stepped in and said, you know, and deemed in, I guess, 2007, um, that that was unconstitutional. So, you know, without the kind of support, um, on the part of the federal government and all branches of the federal government, you know, any kind of effort to promote empathy could be thwarted at the worst, if not just supported. Um, and, you know, <coughs> I think um, arguably, um, you know, Barack Obama's 
use the term empathy uh, in ways that, I mean, obviously Bill Clinton could have been dubbed the first really empathic president because he just threw the phrase uh, or, or so, is so closely associated with the phrase, I feel your pain. <coughs> um, it certainly perfected a certain look or demeanor that suggested empathy, but uh, Barack Obama, um, you know, sort of very explicitly used the term throughout his campaign and um, into his um, first year or so of office, although clearly there was some backlash after the nomination of Sotomayor to the Supreme Court that perhaps, you know, at the very least caused him to search out for other language to use instead. Um, so I do wonder, you know, I wonder if, if uh, Obama hasn't fully been able to change the conversation and really inject that term into our national cultural discourse more deeply than it had been. Um, be hard-pressed to come up with someone else or think of some other president or presidential candidate who could do a better job than he has or, or have greater success at really changing the conversation. Yeah, it's, uh, um, you're talking about like Barack Obama said that he was going to choose a Supreme Court justice that had empathy as well as his whole campaign was around that the country had an empathy deficit. Right. And it's like kind of, well, where are, we, where are we at with that now? Like, you know, what, where is it? The dialogue seems to have ended around that at a national level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is a little sad. Um, yeah. So I kind of see it maybe that we can reignite it. You know, it's like, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, people like yourself and the greater good and, you know, other organizations that uh, need to kind of reignite that dialogue and bring it front and center. Yeah. To... Uh, that's our hope. That's our mission. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you asked for, for a few suggestions for building a culture there's you know promoting contact across groups is mm -hmm. is one big one and obviously going hand in hand with that is also um teaching it i mean obviously you know uh trying to teach it to kids teach it in schools um probably obviously the most effective way of really building a culture from the ground up so that means um you know zeroing in i mean obviously for parents trying to encourage perspective taking trying to find those teachable moments to reinforce to kids that, you know, other people do have thoughts and feelings and, you know, entire worldviews and perspectives um, in the same way that the kids do themselves. And so encouraging them to recognize that and also to try as actively as they can to just imagine um, what that experience, what those thoughts and feelings uh, someone else may be having in a given situation might be um, to really help nurture their own moral imaginations, you know, and their own empathic understandings of other people. Um, and then in schools, I mean, I think there are certain practices that I think are really being, um, are really being uh, zeroed in on. And there's, we just actually published an article last week about the, I'm sure you know, the um, Ashoka Foundation's Start Empathy Initiative and their change makers competition to try to zero, to try to identify the most promising programs, you know, in schools and beyond that are trying to teach empathy to kids. And they had over 600 uh, entries in this competition and then ultimately selected 14 winners and you know one of the lessons that comes up I think both in looking at those winners and looking at the research um, is you know promoting promoting contact and also um, encouraging people to tell their own stories um, and learn the stories of, of other people and starting to understand that you know they have their own history their own cultural histories potentially as well as their own subjective emotional or intellectual experiences that are really similar to one's own. Um, and, you know, internalizing that lesson from a really early age is important. Um, and similarly, uh, the whole cooperative learning movement is similar to, I guess, sort of what I was describing before is what often happens in workplaces where when you start to um, feel like, you know, in a workplace that your fate is intertwined with someone else and the success of your job or your company is um, intertwined with the performance of someone else and you're working together on the same team, um, you know, you'll start to see one another as, as really as members of the same team fighting for the same cause rather than just as, you know, disparate others. And I think similarly, there's a movement in education to promote, you know, group learning opportunities um, so that kids aren't just isolated, really feel like, you know, they work together, have a shared stake in some bigger goal or some bigger project. Um, and I think, you know, there's some research certainly suggesting that that does a lot, can do a lot to break down barriers between kids. Um, so I think that's, that's huge. And there's, you know, at least some research recently finding that 
um, kids classrooms that promote more cooperative learning um, actually have less incidences of fewer incidences of, of bullying and aggression. Um, and obviously, there's a fair amount of research or an emerging literature on the links between bullying and empathy and the extent to which bullying might be caused by some type of empathy de deficit, um, if not you know, pathological, but at least you know, in the moment, one's inability to really understand how one's actions might affect somebody else. Um, and some of the solutions, for instance, the program No Bully, that was one of the Ashoka winners, um, their whole model is really based on bringing empathy into the process of um, dialogue between um, not just bullies and victims of bullying, but also um, and bringing mediators as well, but other kids, other peers in the classroom to have um, you know smaller group dialogues um, around how incidents of bullying make everyone feel on all sides of the equation, both the bully, the perpetrator, the perpetrator, the victim, and uh, bystanders as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like uh, you're saying, uh, bring different communities together. Uh, within society is kind of one way just so that they're starting to dialogue and not getting alienated behind their you know gated communities I guess uh, and then within schools there's a whole curriculum of things that can be done to really foster uh, empathy within within schools mm -hmm. those seem to yeah. be the two uh, really big yeah within points. schools and and you know even just in everyday life with with kids I think you know being able to to so the very most basic level, encourage perspective taking, make kids recognize that other people have their own kind of subjective experience of the world. Um, you know, similar or analogous to one's own experience is, I think, a really, you know, essential lesson for kids to internalize early in life. I think you'd also mentioned uh, equality or inequality. A uh, lesson is is a factor. Yeah, that was my my the third area. And then there's you know some interesting research coming out of Berkeley here that uh, Dr. Keltner, you know, I colleague here at the Greater Good Science Center has been doing um, in his lab, finding, really documenting the um, social and emotional impact, you know, the psychological impact of inequality, of power imbalances, not just among um, people on the lower end of the totem pole, which has been researched a little bit more deeply before, but looking at people, um, what the sense, what one's feeling of inflated status or power especially um, socioeconomic status, does to one's um, psychological experience and specifically one's ability to feel compassion and empathy for other people. Um, finding that essentially if you people who have higher social, socioeconomic status do worse on tests of uh, empathic accuracy, just being able to read and identify someone else's emotions. <clears throat> um, and rather than just suggesting that you know, there's something kind of innately wrong or different about people who attain a lot of wealth. They've actually found when you bring someone into a lab and say, okay, imagine that you are at this high point on the socioeconomic ladder um, and now try to take this test. Regardless of one's actual socioeconomic status outside of the lab, they do worse on the tests of empathy when they start to imagine themselves, get this inflated sense of, of status and power. And similarly, People, whether they were outside of the lab, high or low, SES, when they're made to feel lower on the ladder, they actually do better. Um, <clears throat> so there's some, some then thinking that, you know, uh, greater feelings of wealth make one focus more on oneself and one's inflated sense of self um, and become less concerned or less attuned to what other people are thinking or experiencing. Um, so that certainly argues for guarding against great disparities in socioeconomic status and, and great inequality because, um, you know, arguably that would be um, detrimental to one's ability to experience sympathy. We, we often think about it in the reverse, right, that, you know, uh, inequality results from a lack of empathy because you don't care about other people, you don't care so much about, you know, uh, distrib you know fair distribution of, of opportunities or of, of wealth. Um, and so, you know, inequality can grow out of that lack of empathy. And what this research suggests is that it, it also goes the other way, is that, um, you know, a lack of, of empathy can grow from inequality, which suggests those two things together suggest a really vicious cycle where a lack of empathy can cause um, greater inequality and greater inequality can in turn uh, reduce empathy. Mm. 
So as, as you were talking about, uh, you know, the teaching kindness and the Ashoka program, I actually showed the greater good uh, site uh, while you were talking about that. And, and now you're talking about another uh, research project at the greater good about the social inequality. And, and is there other research uh, going on there at the greater good? Maybe you could talk a little bit about any other research or with, at the greater good uh, around empathy and compassion. So a lot of a lot of what we do is um, we fund research um, mostly in the form of, of fellowships to graduate and undergraduate students um, here at Berkeley, trying to kind of seed the next generation of researchers. And some of those fellows have been doing this work that I was alluding to that um, has been you know, looking at um, the roots of compassion, and empathy specifically looking at how they uh, relate to socioeconomic status. And one of our most recent fellows, uh, Jenny Steller, did research suggesting that people who um, either are of higher socioeconomic status, made to feel like they are of higher SES, actually feel and behave less compassionately. Um, so, you know, that's been perhaps recently the most relevant research. Look, going back a couple of years, another one of our fellows and uh, postdoctoral researcher who we were funding did some of the first work really zeroing in on the genetic basis of empathy uh, as well. That's uh, Serena Rodriguez and Laura Saslow. Um, done some work we've written up on our website as well. Um, you know, most recently now, we've actually, um, in terms of research projects, we are um, running a project now to expand the science of gratitude, um, which is you know another big topic that we focus on in addition to empathy and compassion and altruism um, not not entirely unrelated I mean there are just different paths to kind of promoting the greater good and living a more meaningful life um, so that in terms of research right now is one of the big projects that we're, we're in, in looking for um, the most cutting edge research that's going to advance the science of gratitude and, and developing practices for helping uh, people <coughs> to cultivate more gratitude in their everyday lives. Mm. So uh, quickly, you, what would be the relationship of gratitude with uh, empathy? Like how do they relate? We kind of explore a little bit of compassion and empathy. And this is a real interest to me. It's like, I like to take all the, all the different values, you know, peace and, and nonviolence and, community and then relate them each to uh, empathy and how and and so this is of real interest to me and it hasn't been much work or really any work that I that I know of that has explicitly identified a connection but I think you look at the research on gratitude over the last 10 years I think um, I think there is a pretty clear connection in that the way that gratitude has been identified by the researchers um, especially uh, Robert Emmons who's been kind of the leading scientific researcher of gratitude for the last 10 years, and he's at UC Davis, and he's also a co-director of our gratitude project. Gratitude really involves, it isn't just appreciating nice things in life, because there is sort of this other whole idea or concept of appreciation, but gratitude is really about recognizing good things in your life as a gift um, from someone else, mm -hmm. you know, who intended in some way, often, um, to provide you with that gift. So it's recognizing that good things in life often come from outside of yourself and recognizing that those good things um, often come from the work of, you know, some other person, potentially you know, some other higher, higher power. So it could be being grateful to God, but also grateful to your parents, grateful to a friend, grateful, you know, to a colleague who um, either just gave you a gift, you know, it could be a, a nice present, but it also could be an opportunity, you know, or something that could be a little bit more abstract that when you think about it, you really recognize um, was a gift um, and, you know, it enabled you to both enjoy something positive and perhaps achieve something great yourself. Um, and for me, I think, you know, in thinking about it, the connection to empathy is I think it often involves, um, again, sort of recognizing the intentions, you know, or the thoughts of someone else that, you know, when you actually... Um, you know, in, in essential to that whole process of seeing something else as a gift, something else that someone has really tried to give you for your own benefit and really being grateful for that intention uh, and, and for that action. Um, it really, I think, requires seeing that other person as, you know, an own, their own, you know, independent actor who had this desire to do right, 
do something nice for you. Um, and when you start to see that someone else you know, and try to put yourself in their shoes and kind of imagine um, what their own thinking or feelings or intentions might be, um, then I think it becomes a lot easier. I think you're really then encouraged, motivated to, <coughs> um, uh, to, to be grateful, you know, for this thing that this person has, has given you rather than just seeing it as this great windfall that somehow kind of miraculously landed in your lap or that you can kind of take credit for um, because of your own ingenuity and, and moral superiority. You know, I think instead to really be able to appreciate that, no, a lot of the good things you have in your life are because someone else was looking out for you or someone else did some really nice thing for you or for your community. Um, it requires, you know, being able to have that moral imagination and, and being able to recognize their intentions um, and seeing kind of the goodness in their intentions and recognizing that they are able to kind of transfer some of that goodness your way. Hmm. So if, if we're kind of self-absorbed, self-centered, we're kind of like blocked off from others and the gratitude is kind of, it's kind of like opening. There's like a sense of opening and kind of taking in and not kind of like grasping maybe like that. And then it's just that, that warmth that comes from that sense of uh, connection with others Perhaps, yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. I think gratitude is often described as like a social emotion. Um, it really is about you know your relationships with other people, and so not <coughs> not responding to good things by feeling like you were entitled to them, um, <coughs> but recognizing you know that they are a result of your connections to other people and other people's you know actions or or intentions toward you. Mm. And it maybe even seeing your own feelings that come up. And not grasping them, but it's kind of like a self gratitude kind of not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Certainly, I think um, there is. Yeah, that a certain kind of openness, a certain kind of. <coughs> excuse me. Um, um, yeah, a certain kind of recognition that can be described as like a sense of interconnection with other people or with with the universe, you know, and, and not just seeing yourself as some own, you know, isolated atom in the universe well there's so many different areas i'd love to explore with you but i don't want to you know we've gone for about an hour i don't want to keep you uh over um i should i have a uh a meeting that i should probably tend to but this is great i really enjoy the conversation well we didn't get to the uh the uh david brooks article but i think that's like a probably like a 20 30 minute discussion of its own uh, so I don't know, perhaps we can have that discussion at another time. And um... Yeah, let's do that. Um, I, I should probably go, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you wanted to delve more deeply into some of the issues that that raised um, to, to do that justice. Yeah. We yeah. Take, so, um, well, this is great. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. We've met once before. We had Starbucks. We talked for like an hour and a half or something. So I'm glad we got a chance to record the dialogue. It's, always, it's been real fun talking to you. Thanks for putting it together. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll line that up then, and I'll let you get to your meeting. And thanks, uh, Jason. Look thanks. forward to our next uh, dialogue. And have some other ideas I'd like to run by you as well. So, yeah, we'll okay. talk. Okay, great. Bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.